The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations present The Pacific Story. In the mounting fury of world conflict, events in the Pacific are taking on ever greater importance. Here is the story of the Pacific and the millions of people who live around this greater sea. The drama of the people whose destiny is at stake in the Pacific War. Here, as another public service, is the tale of the war in the Pacific and its meaning to us and to the generations to come. Xinjiang, China's Wild West. On the roof of Central Asia, where Russia and China and India meet, in the center of the greatest landmass on Earth, at the point farthest on Earth from any sea, there lies fabulous Xinjiang, or Chinese Turkestan, crossroads of conflict for 2,000 years, and today a teeming center of activity in a war-torn world. Across this fabulous land wound the ancient Silk Road, where for thousands of years caravans plotted between the Far East and Europe. We are taking the silks of Cathay to Rome. We shall bring back furs and priceless treasures. And over this same road through Xinjiang past Marco Polo and Tamerlane and Genghis Khan. Fierce hordes, the Mongols, the Turks, and the Huns swept out of these plains and mountains and deserts and sacked the cities of Europe and the rich centers of the Orient. Now, for years, Xinjiang has been a crossroads of conflict. For Xinjiang is a rich land, a land of unbelievable wealth and resources. And Xinjiang is a land of many peoples, a melting pot of the little known peoples of Central Asia where the influences of Russia and Britain and China meet. At the turn of the century, rumors filled the air of Xinjiang. The Russians are plotting to march through Xinjiang to invade India. The British are sending agents into Xinjiang with the idea of developing a road through it to Urka. The Chinese are going to take important steps to keep the Russians and the British from extending their interest in Xinjiang. And as Japan rose as a power and a peril in the Far East, there were rumors of another kind. The Japanese are conspiring to move into Xinjiang and use it as a base to set the Muslims of the Middle East in revolt. With the passing years, it became apparent that with the Japanese, at least, there was some truth in the rumors. Truth, because in Xinjiang, there are many peoples with many conflicting interests. This man is a Kyrgyz. We are shepherds of the upland pastures. There are 60,000 of us Kyrgyz here in Xinjiang. The Kyrgyz are attractive and civilized people. And this man is a Tatar. We come from European Russia, we Tatars. The Tatars are an exclusive people. They stay to themselves. Many of them are rich. And this is a Mongol. We left Russia to escape the rule of the Tatars. The Mongols have been in Xinjiang a long time. And this is a white Russian. There are 14,000 of us white Russians here. We came here when the Soviets overthrew the Tsar. The white Russians are farmers and clerks and laborers. And this is an Uyghur. We are Muslims. We have been here in Xinjiang since before the time of Genghis Khan. The Uyghurs are the most numerous of all the peoples of Xinjiang. They number nearly three million, three quarters of the population of Xinjiang. And all these peoples are ruled by the Chinese, the sons of Han, who number only 182,000. All these peoples. Some speak Turkish. Some of them speak dialects of Turkish. The Mongols speak their own language. The Russians speak Russian. But the official language is Chinese. The sands of Xinjiang have been soaked with the blood of all these people. We, Uyghurs, have fought the Chinese a hundred times. We have joined forces with the Tungans against the Chinese. But when we found the Tungans cruel and bloodthirsty, we have joined with the Chinese against the Tungans. Again and again, the Chinese have fought the bloody rebellions of the Muslim millions. But even this has only been part of the conflict of Xinjiang. 
The other peoples of Xinjiang, each with its own interest, have for centuries used the sword against each other. We of the cities are against the people of the country. We nomads are against those who have settled down. We Turkish-speaking Muslims are against the Chinese-speaking Muslims. We Mongol nomads are against the Turkish nomads. And behind these conflicts is the basic value of the place all these people occupy. Fabulous Xinjiang. <laughs> Xinjiang lies almost in the very middle of the great landmass of Europe and Asia. It lies in that shadow land behind the front doors of China and Russia. It has been little trodden by men of the outside world, yet it has been the crossroads of trade for centuries. Its plains and mountains and deserts that last are coming to have meaning to the great powers of the world. For years, its borders have throbbed with the beat of marching feet. Seems to me that Xinjiang is a buffer between China and Russia. It's more than that. Because of the nature of Xinjiang, it affects everything that happens in India, Afghanistan, and Iran, as well as in China and Soviet Asia. I see. Then it is also affected by everything that happens in these states. That's true. You see, Xinjiang is a large land, two and one half times the size of France. Yes. Seems to be a link between two different kinds of worlds. Well, to the lands around it, it may be regarded as a vast passage from one of these lands to the other. But within itself, it is a land of wonderful promise. Promise. Under its surface lies a treasure. Xinjiang today is like California before 1849. We are mining gold here in Altai. There is so much gold here. But for centuries, this has been called the Golden Mountain. Gold mines. When they are developed, they will attract railroads. Here we are mining coal. We have coal at Urumqi, Kulja, and Kashka. Yes, coal in great quantities. And copper and oil. This is just one of the ten districts of Xinjiang where oil has been discovered. And we are prospecting in other districts for more. Petroleum. Let this Chinese tell you the importance of oil in this part of the world. Highways are the arteries of development in any land. In China, we are building many highways. But we have virtually no oil. To import oil is too costly. Unless we have oil and gasoline for our vehicles, our highways are of little value. The oil of Xinjiang is priceless to China. Yes. Xinjiang has oil, and it has other products known round the world. Look down at those fields of corn and rice and barley and millet. Look down at those orchards, the apricots and peaches, the luscious grapes, rich yellow figs and the juicy melons. Ask this Uyghur about the melons of Xinjiang. The melons of Xinjiang are known throughout Asia. The Xinjiang pilgrim and the melons. He was one named Ma, and he set out one day from Hami. He set out to see the great iron bridge that the Americans had built over the Yellow River near Lanzhou. Midway in his journey, he met a countryman from Lanzhou named Sha. I have heard such wondrous stories about your harmy melons that I am on my way to Xinjiang to see them. And I have heard such wondrous stories of your high bridge that I am on my way to Lanzhou to see it. Yes, our bridge is the highest yet. A year ago today, a man fell from it. And when I left, his body had not yet reached the river. Ah, ah yes. Uh, concerning our melons, you are wasting your time traveling all the way to Hami to see them. They grow to such great size that by the time next year, they will be with you in Lanzhou. <laughs> Luscious fruits and field crops, and magnificent horses and cattle, and minerals and oil. Precious oil. But besides all these, still another thing makes Tian Keng valuable its strategic importance. And this, as much as the others, has been the crux of its history the crux of the squabbling and scrambling for its control. By 
1932, Japan had seized Manchuria, renamed it Manchukuo, and set up a puppet government. By 1932, a Chinese general named Sheng Shitsai was chief of the general staff of the border defense of Xinjiang. The Japanese will not stop in Manchuria. Sheng knew the Japanese. The Japanese are imperialists. Sheng had studied in Japan, had graduated from the Japanese Military Academy. They are trying to set up a puppet Mongol system in Inner Mongolia. As one of Chiang Kai-shek's high officers, Sheng understood Japanese tactics. Unless the Japanese operations in Inner and Outer Mongolia are brought under control, they might gain access to the caravan routes into northwest China and Xinjiang. The Overland Passages are the lifelines of Central Asia. There are indications that the Japanese are preparing to take Rehol. That will give them a corridor from Manchuria to Inner Mongolia. By this maneuver, Japan could cut China off from Russia. For now, Japan was entrenched in Manchuria and was looking ahead to her full-scale war against China. Now a new cycle of rebellions of the Muslim masses was underway. You know, Shanks, Yes, Colonel? A Tungang force of great strength is moving towards Xinjiang. Who is leading the force? He is one called Ma Chung Ying. Ma Chung Ying, yes. He is only 26 years old, but he is an able general. There is evidence that he is supported by the Japanese. Then he is well equipped. Call together the staff at once, Colonel. From Kansu province, Ma Chung Ying, the 26-year-old Tungan Napoleon, swept with devastating terror across the frontier into Xinjiang. Ah, kill the infidel Chinese! Slaughter them! Burn the dwellings of the infidel Chinese! Kill them, everyone! Attack every city and every village of the infidel Chinese! Show no mercy! Kill them! Ma Chung Ying swept through the mountains and butchered the Chinese by the tens of thousands. Once again, the soil of Xinjiang was drenched with blood. Once again, the Muslim masses of Xinjiang were in ferment. General Sheng appealed to Russia for help. Here are heavy trucks for transport and armored cars for combat. In the Russian trucks came machine guns, ammunition, and field weapons. Here are bombers to destroy military bases and installations and fighters to trace the ground force. Russian war material flowed into Xinjiang, and with it came Russian troops and Russian advisors. Ma Chung Ying scourged and slaughtered as he surged forward, and General Sheng gathered strength to meet him. Here is the information, General Sheng. Yes? Ma Chung Ying is concentrated on the Urumqi River. You have the disposition of his forces? Yes, General Sheng. His cavalry is concentrated here, and his line of communications is here, behind... With three white Russian regiments and with his own Chinese troops, General Shang moved against Ma Chung Ying outside of Urumqi. To all the states bordering on Xinjiang, this was more than another in the long, long series of Muslim rebellions. For years, the borders of Xinjiang had echoed to the sound of marching troops of China and Russia and Britain. But this rebellion meant that a fourth power was, for the first time, exerting important influence in the affairs of Xinjiang. This was Japan. If Ma Chung Ying succeeded, Japan would, in effect, have a line of control from the Pacific to the heart of the greatest land mass on Earth. We were attacked from this position. Ma Chung Ying will counterattack with his cavalry. And then we shall strike with our full power. Riding like the wind, the young Tungan Napoleon's cavalry swept down upon Sheng's forces. Here he comes in, Sheng. Exactly as we planned. And here come our Russian straighting Look at those flames. Flying so low, they are cutting the Tungans down like wheat. Not many of our Chung Ying horsemen will live through this. No. Look at them fall. Horses and men, one upon the other. They are breaking ranks. They are scattering like seeds before the wind. Can Ma Chu Ying rally them? No man can rally cavalry against straighting flames. Ma Chu Ying is lost. Ma Chu Ying was defeated. 
But from that time until 1937, when the Japanese unleashed their full-scale attack upon China, the Japanese tried again and again, through their efforts in Inner Mongolia, to promote unrest among the powerful Muslim minorities of northwest China. But meantime, General Sheng had risen to power, and the Russians had extended their influence in Xinjiang. Xinjiang was emerging as a world focal point, and observers who had never before taken notice of it now keenly watched its development. General Sheng permitted Russia to establish the Soviet garrison here on the condition that the soldiers wear Chinese uniforms. Oh, that's a sort of index uh, of the importance of the Russians here. Russia, perhaps more than any other nation, is exerting influence in Xinjiang affairs. Yes. I recall the movie we went to yesterday was Russia. Most of the experts here in Xinjiang are Russians, mining and structural engineers, doctors, agricultural advisors, technicians. Well, uh, what about money? Russia has sent a great deal of money into Xinjiang, too. In the next several years, there was more and more evidence of Russian influence in Xinjiang. The Russians brought in modern machinery. And the Uyghurs, the Kazakhs, the Tungans, and the Tatars watched them lay down modern roads. My father would not have dreamed there would ever be a road like this in our country. The roads have brought motor cars. And now it is possible to go as far in one hour as we used to with a caravan in days. They are changing our country, General. They have built roads to our mines. And where once we brought out our gold and copper and coal on the backs of beasts, now it is sometimes brought out by these growling machines. Yes. And in our skies are other machines that roar. The Russians have brought them. Yes, and the Russians have built the great spaces where these roaring machines of the air settle down. The Soviets brought in the airplanes and trained the pilots and built the airfields. The Soviets trained and equipped the army. And after the Japanese launched their attack on China, Russian advisors were put in all departments of the Xinjiang government. And Soviet schools were opened. This would indicate that Russia was planning to establish a communist regime among the peoples of Xinjiang. On the contrary... No effort of this kind was ever made. While the Russians were sending men and material, General Sheng was taking steps to reconstruct Xinjiang. Among the conflicting factions, he sought to bring about some measure of reconciliation. In the face of the age-old antipathies, many of the factions could do no more than cease active opposition to each other. But even this meant progress. First and foremost, there must be racial equality. Racial equality among a state of fierce and belligerent peoples of different faiths. Second, we must guarantee religious freedom. Religious freedom in a land where blood has been spilled for thousands of years because of conflicting creeds. You see, these principles are evidence that far off as it may be, some kind of understanding between the peoples of Xinjiang is on the way. It is all based on mutual trust, it seems to me. Yes. And these two principles are only part of General Cheng's declaration. He has also declared such policies as anti-imperialism, clean government, reconstruction, peace, and kinship to Sovietism. Sovietism. Uh-huh. That seems to be significant. Actually, Soviet Russia has withdrawn from Xinjiang. And this can be interpreted as showing Russia's basic thinking so far as Central Asia is concerned. Not only did General Sheng proclaim a policy comparable to the Magna Carta to the peoples of Xinjiang, but under his leadership, Xinjiang developed from an isolated wilderness into a province with most of the modern innovations. Electric lights? Yes. And many of us who a few years ago did not know what a telephone was are now daily users of the telephone. Uh, radio? Our own people are trained in radio... And we not only use them, but we build many of our own. Electricity, telephone, and radio. In a land where the vestiges of thousands of years ago are still evident. Airplanes? We are as familiar with them as people anywhere else in the world. Newspapers? Yes, this newspaper is printed here daily. And it brings us all the news of the world. Uh, motion pictures? We see the same pictures here that are shown in the great cities of America and England. Airplanes, newspapers, motion pictures. Ideas. Ideas in many forms. These are flowing in upon Sing Kyung as a deluge. And out of it is coming literacy. And this literacy is the same to Uyghur, Tatar, Tungan, Kazakh, and Uzbek alike. To all, it is building a basis on which in some degree they can meet. I am a Chinese school teacher. Within the past few years, we have expanded our primary schools from 30 schools to more than 2,000. 
And some of our teachers even follow the nomads to teach the children. These are helping to knit together the thinking of the peoples of Xinjiang. I am a Chinese social worker. To help promote understanding, we are forming racial clubs in Tiwa and in all the biggest centers of Xinjiang. Education and social work, basic steps, basic measures come to a forgotten land to weld together peoples who traditionally have slaughtered each other. And these are only part of General Sheng's broad program of reconstruction and of modernization. You see, most of the Chinese in the governing class here in Xinjiang today are from Manchuria. From Manchuria? Refugees from the Japanese? Principally, yes. Oh. And the Japanese took Manchuria in 1931 and 1932. The Manchurian army retreated out here to Xinjiang. Mm -hmm. uh, how big an army was that? Uh, about 10,000. Oh. Most of their officers were men educated and trained in leadership. They are the ones who are leading the way here today. Of course, for centuries before 1931, other Chinese had come here. Peasants, merchants, and artisans. Well, it seems to me that many of the persons I've seen here cannot be identified definitely as of any particular strain. Actually, nearly all of the races here intermarry, except the Tatars and the Uzbeks. But gradually, the racial lines are fading. But very gradually. <laughs> in Europe and the war in Asia are still only echoes in Xinjiang. The edges of the great seas became the war front, the edges of Europe and the edges of Asia. And Xinjiang, as far from any ocean as a place can be on Earth, became one of the many rear areas of the war. But the coming of World War II made Xinjiang more important than it had ever been before. General Sheng, as vice commander of Generalissimo Chung Kai-shek's 8th War Area and governor of Xinjiang, took steps to prepare Xinjiang for its part in China's war. We have hardly touched the oil preserves of Xinjiang. It seems to be a completely modern field here. Yes, all the equipment is modern. Except that old piece there. That's made of wood, isn't it? Yes, it is very crude. The wells were worked with wooden machinery of that kind before the Russians first came in and installed modern machinery. This field is as modern as any in the world. The Russian experts taught us much about oil operations. Now we know that there is an area of oil land here 1,000 miles long. Now you will need all that oil to develop this country out here. First, we must help win the war against Japan. Yeah, China needs oil badly. It will take a long time to develop these oil fields as it will take a long time to develop the many other resources of Xinjiang. But this country out here is like your California before your gold rush. Once the world learned the value of the new frontier, people flocked in by tens of thousands. In the ancient cities whose beginnings are lost in the sands of the deserts, modern buildings are going up. Lumber sawed by hand is brought in from the forest along the mountain ranges. Wool from Xinjiang's 12 million sheep is woven into cloth. Flour from the grain of Xinjiang's rich valleys is milled in modern industries. And Tiwa, the capital, is being reconstructed and modernized. What? A steamroller way out here in Xinjiang? Yes. It's the only one in all Xinjiang. Xinjiang is three times the size of Texas. <laughs> Not much work out here for operators of steamrollers, then. All that operator there can do. You see, he's doing an excellent job of making this a main street that Tiwa can really be proud of. Is uh, this part of General Shang's plan? Yes. General Sheng is building Tiwa into a modern metropolis. Tiwa. Why is it that this city sometimes is called Tiwa and sometimes called Urumqi? Well, Urumqi is the Turkish name of the city. Oh. You see, there are really four languages here in Tiwa. Chinese, Turkish, Russian, and Mongolian. Well, that explains the difference in the signs here on the street. Yes. Now let's walk down the street. Yes. Yeah. See that building over there? Mm-hmm. That's a Chinese store. Chinese store, huh? How can he get his merchandise way out here? That's the big problem. He came from Sing Tao himself and brought a good deal of his merchandise with him. But now he, as all the other merchants of Sing Kiang, is running low. Are there no trucks available for transport? Not many. There were quite a few, some thousands. But most of these are worn out now. Because of the war, replacements are scarce. Mm hmm. I see. Yeah. Let's stop a minute at this market. All right. Say, look at those melons. Those are the famous Hami melons. 
finest melons in all Asia, and perhaps in the world. Mm. Hey, just smell of this one. Mm -hmm. And they're just as delicious as they are fragrant. And look at those grapes and apples. Think of what sink young produce alone will mean when this country is developed and gets its lines of transportation. Xinjiang now stands on the threshold of development. Because of a geographical situation, she is more easily accessible to Soviet Russia than to China to the east and India to the south. Thus, Russia has played the biggest role in her development thus far. But now Russia has withdrawn from Xinjiang, and now the development must be done by the enterprising pioneers, who, as in the development of America's great west, must hew out their own world. Today, through General Sheng's efforts, fabulous landlocked Xinjiang is open to the world. We have roads, but we need more roads. The opening of our communications provides a great opportunity for Western as well as Eastern enterprise. Yes. Xinjiang is almost like our new land. It needs everything. Yes. Airlines and railroads must be built. And we have radio and newspapers and motion pictures. But these must be developed. All your needs out here seem to be tied together. To be interrelated. Exactly. When our irrigation systems are developed, this will lead to more agricultural development. And when we have more agricultural development, then we shall have still greater need of transportation. Then, in effect, a new world is taking shape out here. It is a new frontier. Everything is waiting to be developed. Our minds are now in operation, but we have not begun to touch them. We have only scratched the surface. New colonists will probably play a big part out here. The time may not be too far away when the great immigration of colonists will begin. For Xinjiang will give them the chance to make their own way in the world. And that is what all of us are seeking. The people of Xinjiang, as well as the great powers around Xinjiang, know that Xinjiang has another value. Its strategic position. And Nazi Germany also knows this. After Pearl Harbor, when Nazi Germany severed diplomatic relations with China, the German ministers left Chongqing with a prophecy. We regret but we must leave. Oh, it is unfortunate. We say goodbye now as a mere formality. We hope that China and Germany may resume cordial relations in the not-too-distant future. We shall return, possibly more quickly than we expect. Uh, can, can we interpret that as an omen of hope? That you will have to decide when we return through Xinjiang. If, when the Nazis invaded Russia in 1941 and drove southeast to the Caucasus, they had been able to drive through Russian Turkestan and Xinjiang and join hands with the Japanese or with Wang Qingwei's Chinese puppet government, the story of the war in the Pacific would be different. been listening to The Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations as a public service, to clarify events in the Pacific and to make understandable the cross-current of life in the Pacific Basin. For a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. To repeat, for a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. The Pacific Story is written and directed by Arnold Marquis. The material for tonight's broadcast was largely taken from the book Gateway to Asia, Think Young by Martin Norris. Your musical score was composed and conducted by Thomas Peluso. Your narrator was Gane Whitman. This is the National Broadcasting Company.